The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Now let's go to Hebrews, the eighth chapter, for a moment. <clears throat> we're, we're in, of course, the chapter 8, 9, and 10, looking at the new covenant. Uh, it w I wanted to do a creation series, and uh, I didn't want to go back to Genesis with it. <clears throat> and so I went to Romans with it. Oh, no. No, that's tomorrow night's lesson. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, and if some people were frowning. The rest of you didn't even know what I was talking about. <clears throat> I don't know. I just went to my Wednesday night Bible study that quick. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm in Hebrews. The President's Day. I know. Um, eighth, I'm in verse eight and nine tonight. And um, we're. You'll notice that there's a quote from somewhere, and of course, if you look in your study Bible, you'll see this is Jeremiah. See, we're in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and, and I'm just dealing, and he deals with the new covenant, and he's, he says, Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, saith the Lord. And so we're going to do a study on that tonight. Um, but my study, notice my study says all scripture is inspired of God. Right, which, which comes from Second Timothy on the top of your paper, from Second Timothy third chapter sixteen and seventeen, <laughs> and he says all Scripture is inspired of God, or if you have a King James Bible, it says God breathed, and it means the same thing. Actually, the word God breathed is a better translation of the Greek word theonoustos, theonoustos. It means God breathed. It's made up of two words, of course, theos meaning God, and nomio, which means to breathe, to breathe. Uh, and so he says all scripture, and it's God breathing. So all scripture is God breathed. I, I like that because it, it carries the concept of inhale and exhale of the word of God. It's the reason I like God breathed. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. If you're spirit-filled and I'm spirit-filled, that, that, that should go on today. In this Bible study, that should go on. Um, and then it tells you so that, this is the reason why that's important, so that the man of God, that's those who have just gone through this exercise, the man of God may be adequate. Notice there's a comma, pause, equipped for every good work. Notice that it, people run that together. They say adequately equipped. That's not what that says, and that's not what that means. It means you're adequate and you're equipped. And how are you adequate? Now, listen, this is important because we understand what he says, equipped for every good work. We're talking about service. But adequate, adequate to be equipped for great ministry is how you behave in the classroom when you take in the word of God because it's there for what? It's profitable to make you adequate for great service. See that? And he tells you how the word of God is supposed to work in your life when you're positive for, for training, for correction, for reproof, for, for, you know, so for teaching. So, um, I'm going, to I'm going to run an exercise with you tonight that's going to be very important 
And so I'm going to combine the idea of all scriptures in spite of God, inspired of God, and and it's designed to bring you to a place of of adequacy to do great spiritual ministry, to have great spiritual service to other people. You understand that? For in the name of God. And we're going to see that because as new covenant people, that's where we are. And you're going to see tonight, no matter how you view the canonization of the scripture, and let me tell you, there are a lot of views about it. The bottom line is all scripture is inspired of God. Now, I want to go to one more passage. I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. I want you to go to Second Peter because... We're going to study prophecy tonight. So I want you to go to, I'm in Hebrew, so let's go to 1 Peter, James, you know, and 1 Peter and 2 Peter. So we're going to walk towards Gen uh, Revelation here. We'll go to 2 Peter in the first chapter. And this verse is Im important to us because we're going to deal with prophecy. We're, we're going to talk about, we're reading out of Hebrews, uh, who's quoting Jeremiah 31. And listen to what the writer, again, all scripture is inspired of God <clears throat> and is, is profitable to bring you into adequacy and equip you for great ministry. <clears throat> Look at verse 20 and 21. Uh, but know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture, see the, the, the S, the capital S on scripture means that that, that scripture has been canonized. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy, and, and pay attention to the word no, no prophecy. See, it's used twice, isn't it? That's a marker. Notice that now. See, verse 20, no prophecy, and then he tells you a positive statement. Gives you says no prophecy and gives you a positive statement. And then he comes back in verse 21. No prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, always keep at least those two great Bible verses in mind when, um, when you struggle with, with transliterations from languages to languages. The Bible has, been, has gone from Hebrew to the Septuagint Greek to Koine Greek in canonizational ministry. And in, in the midst of all that, you've got things like Aramaic and all other things combined of culturally in that. And a lot of cultural and historical stuff in it. But always remember this, no matter how, how you're looking at all that, never lose the bottom line. All scripture is inspired of God. No prophecy, no prophecy. And he mentions it twice. Okay? So that these, 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 these verses are very, I got it. These verses are very important. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our study today. Uh, classroom etiquette, you know the principle, at least those who are with us today who drove in and are in attendance. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. How do I know if I'm spiritual or not? Well, you're either spiritual or carnal if you're a believer that, by that I mean you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and the third day to give you life everlasting. To bring you into that dynamics of that life in your life while you're on earth in what Jesus called the abundant life. <clears throat> now, how would you know if you're carnal or spiritual? Well, carnality, the evidence of it would be personal sin awareness the holy spirit would convict you your conscience would convict there would be a lot of evidence in your life of whether or not you've committed sin if you're aware of it to get out of carnality and back into spirituality you need to apply the principle of confession of sin such as in first john 1 9 if we confess our sins that could be mental attitude sins it could be overt sins it could be sins of the tongue at least those three categories. Could, be, could even be disobedience. 
But if you're aware of it, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you and put you back into fellowship with him and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that's essential for Bible study. We call that classroom etiquette. So I give you that are with us tonight in class as well as those who are visiting with us by the internet to take the same protocol. Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us the word of God. All scripture is inspired of God. No prophecy is, uh, is by the will of man. It comes by the movement of the Holy Spirit, both in the scriptures and in our, in our human spirit. We pray tonight as we look at this passage, we see the reality of it in our own personal lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We're looking at, when you're looking at the dynamics of Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and I think this is probably our, about our third lesson in this, on the new covenant. I think we're close. I think this might be, I'm not sure. But, but anyhow, uh, the writer of Hebrews is going to write this out in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, 8 through 12. And it's really important to see the dynamics of the different languages and cultures that the word of God has, has gone through to bring this information to us tonight. Um, in our previous lesson, in our previous lesson, we discussed the difficulty in translating one language and dialects and cultures, you know, cultures, culture, one of the great things in the Bible is, is so many cultures are involved and so many cultural mores that it's just interesting to study in that regard. And I mean, if you, like socialization, I mean, the Bible offers you that. If you like history, it offers you that. If you like science, it even offers you that. While the book is written because of theology, there's just it's just kind of an interesting book uh, to study. But when you when you talk about taking the, the Bible into the Hebrew language, it came out of a Semitic language. Uh, the alphabet out of the Semitic, in other words, we don't get to Hebrew language until we get up into the uh, into Abraham, right? Who's, who is the Hebrew, and, and that language he had and the language uh, that he came into are, are Semitic, you know, Sham, uh, Sethites, you know, the Sethites went to the Shamites, and the, the Shamites, uh, a split off from that group was the Abrahamic group, and Abraham was the last Shamite and the first Hebrew. And so, I mean, we got language and we know about the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet actually came out of the Shemites. And even the historians, I mean, I'm talking about historians that are not biblical people. They understand this background. They understand there was an ancient civilization. Um, uh, well, anyhow. So it's kind of interesting. We pick it up. Well, the reason Hebrew is important to us is because the Hebrew language was a language that, that canonized the Old Covenant, the, the Old Testament. And so that part's important. But those of us who study languages and are interested in that thing, um, the Shemites had, any, I mean, we followed their alphabet and all kinds of stuff. But anyhow, so when you get to the Hebrew language, you get, you're into a, a, an interesting um, feature that God established, uh, and we think that the Hebrew canonization was somewhere around the 425 B.C. I mean, people throw out numbers, and and that's an okay number, but, you know, you, you're talking and really, when people give you a specific number like that, it it's kind of scares you, um, but some people smarter than I do give that to you, and so I just share that with you. Most people put it in general terms of centuries, that it was done in the 5th century B.C., but, uh, but I picked this off the colonel, so he put it 425 B.C., and 
and then the Hebrew text was was translated into the Septuagint Greek in somewhere around 280 BC and then it was translated into Koine Greek Koine Greek uh, in 96 AD thereabout a great little book if you haven't got this little book in your library you can pick it up from uh, RB theme juniors uh, biblical ministries Bible ministries you can pick them up um, it's a little book called canonization or, or canonicity canonicity it's an excellent book I've never in a little bitty book it gives you so much now it's ready you know it's a book you can't just go in there and he covers this period here really, really, and canonizations are really tough to get your head around, and he did a phenomenal job. And I put that on your paper because you would be well served, and, and you can pick that book up if they're still operating the way they did when I knew them. They, it's a, if they still have it in print, they'll give it to you. Yeah, you can get that book. That's a book you... Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know, but you ought to contact them. That's my point. You ought to contact them. Um, you ought to contact them. Well, let me talk about four things tonight about this, about why, uh, why all, well, it's important that we understand all scriptures inspired of God is because we've gone through, we've gone through three canonizational uh, printings, and we've gone from the Hebrew canonization, we've gone to the Septuagint canonization. When they got into it, they kind of, they, they took a lot of liberties in the canonization of, the, of that in the first Hebrew Bible in Greek. And so there are, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of things put in there that we wouldn't necessarily have there, but th there's a canonization there of that. And, and that the, the Septuagint was the Bible of the early church. You know, Alexander the Great, he, he put everybody reading Greek, just like American, the American... Uh, free enterprise system put everybody studying English, didn't they? Everybody in English studied. You know why? <laughs> Money. They want to do business. They learned English language because of green. And, uh, and, and what a wonderful door that was because it, it sent our missionaries right into all those places, didn't it? Uh, how good was that? But so uh, I, we want to talk about that. When we read, Jer and I want to give you an example. When we read Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 from the Hebrew text, when we read it from the Hebrew text, it seems, and I mean, even if you read it, it for example, just read it where you are in he and where you are in your Hebrew text. I mean, you don't have to have Hebrew to do this, but I'm just telling you in the Hebrew text. But in your text right here, in the New American Standard, King James, however, however you're reading, um, if, if you read this, if you read uh, verse 8 through 12, which is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, whatever translation you have, if you have a King James or if you have a New American Standard, you're going to find when you go to Jeremiah, uh, it's going to be the same. In the English, in the English. That's not so in the Hebrew and the Greek and the Septuagint. And so I'm going to show you some of that stuff tonight because it's important, okay? It's important at least to our church. I don't know. This might be a good time for other people who are dropping in. And these thought they were, I think I'll just drop in and listen to this guy for a little bit. Um, welcome. When we read Jeremiah 31 from the Hebrew text, it seems as if the new covenant speaks only to the Jews. Because when you read this, like in verse 8, Behold, days are coming, saith the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Right? I mean, that sounds, that sounds exclusive. Doesn't sound inclusive. But when you read this passage in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, you realize something, you realize it is given to all who believe in Jesus Christ. 
Now, how do I know that? Because look at verse 6. Eighth chapter, verse 6. Of course, the book of Hebrews is all about Jesus Christ. It's brought the old covenant, saying the whole covenant is all about Jesus Christ. But look at verse 6. For now he has obtained a more excellent, talking about Jesus Christ, now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. In other words, this says that the whole shift of the, the, whole, the whole old covenant was about Christ coming into the world. And his mission in the world was to go to the cross die for the sins of the world, be buried, and on the day, th third day, raised from the earth, and welcome all who believe in. Agreed? Anybody who believes is in, whosoever, John 3, 16, whosoever is welcomed in. Right? The Old Testament was exclusive with this thing to the house of Judah and Israel. But the key was that that was until Christ came into the world. And when he came into the world, the old covenant would be fulfilled in him and a new covenant would be established. And the new covenant welcomes everybody who will believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when you read, when you read the new covenant out of Jeremiah, out of the Hebrew text, it's exclusive. It's, it's written to the house of Israel, to the house of Judah. But the fact that it's messianic, every time you find a prophecy that's messianic, you've got something that's going to be opened up with his coming and going to the cross is going to open up the door to everybody who will believe. That they can be saved by grace. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be a male. You don't have to be... Uh, educated or socialized or, or materialized. You, you know that Galatians passage, uh, we are all one in Christ. And so th that's a pretty, you know, the days are coming. What days is that? That's the day of Christ. That's messianic. And remember I talked about that's a marker in that passage, right? Days are coming the day after those days. And so there was a progression. The days are coming. When the days come, and there will be days later, and this is how all this works. It's all based on the coming of the Messiah, the coming and the going of the Messiah, and the coming again. <laughs> all right? But listen, how do we know that this is not just to the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Because verse 6 that set this whole thing up says it's based on the mediatorship of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. He is the mediator of a new covenant. He is the mediator of the new covenant. Um, 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6 says that th there is one God and one mediator, and that one mediator is one man, the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, John 14, 6, one that we quote a great deal, it, it's a common a common one that people quote, uh, uh, no man comes to the Father except through me, he says. You know, I am the way, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so how, how, does the new, how was the new covenant established? The coming of Christ, the dying on the cross, buried, resurrected. He ascends back to the Father when he sits down there. You see, on the cross, he's our mediator. He is the mediator of the new covenant. If he doesn't do that, we're out. But he voluntarily did it, didn't he? John 10, 18, he voluntarily did it. He said, no man takes my life from me. I voluntarily lay it down. Right? I mean, that's the way we all should live. We should live in obedience. We all should be surrendering our life to God. Right? I mean, that's... You know, that's protocol. Surrender. Jesus said, look, even Jesus, the son of God, perfect, from birth to death. He says, listen, I surrender my will to the will of the Father. Not by my will, but by his will. His whole life is one of surrender. But listen, your life will too. And it's the only way you'll ever reach the place that God has designed for you in totality. The Christian life is one of obedience to the truth of the word of God. 
mean, it's surrendering your will to his will. That's all that is, isn't it? That's obedience. It's a, I guess, a misdoctrine today. Here's the second thing you need to see. That's the first thing. Second thing. Difficulty in translating from one language and culture into another is enormously difficult and requires the ministry of the Holy Spirit to correctly understand it. That's how difficult it is. The only way you can understand the translation of the Bible throughout centuries of languages and cultures is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible cannot be understood apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Is that not, is that not something? There's no other book. That, that, I mean, there's nothing in the prefix of a book that's ever going to say that that you read, right? They ain't going to say that. But it, that's a prefix to this book. You got to be born again. John 14, 26. Here's the ministry of the Holy Spirit connected with the Word of God. John 14, 26. It says, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all things that I've told you and will bring them into recall. And he will teach it to you. He will record it within you. He will get it settled in your soul. And he'll recall it when it's necessary. That's why it's important to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he'll, he will pull that. And you've had this experience. You ought to be having it all the time. You have it once in a while. When off the something comes up. And all of a sudden he puts a word of God in your soul. And you give it out. And the person says, oh, thank you. I needed that word. Oh, I needed that. That should be a continuum. That's called walking in the spirit. He teaches you in the classroom. And then he applies it through your life. And very often he's telling you, that's that, you know, we talk about that inner dialogue. That's the key. I mean, who are you talking to? Quit talking to yourself. You don't need to. You don't need to. Talk to the, as soon as you talk to yourself, transfer, uh, say, hold the line, please. And put the, put the right person on the phone. Listen, this is the reason that we began Every session we teach under my ministry, we begin with examination, personal examination of your life in regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit as you study the Word of God. And we remind you that not only is this important to learn it, but it's important to live it. The Bible is designed to be learned, to be lived. And that's important for us. And so this is how we operate it. You know, John 16, 13 through 15. You know, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. And sometime you might look at John 16, 13 through 15. Now, let me give you an example. Let me example why you never forget that all Scripture is inspired of God. There's no prophecy, no prophecy that's not inspired by God, none in the Bible. And if it is, he will tag it and say that was false. He will tell you. He won't leave it up for you to figure it out. He'll tell you. That's an apostate thinking. Now, in Hebrews 8, 9, in Hebrews 8, 9, and I want to look at the last part of the verse because there's where our difference is. So I'm going to read verse 9, and then I'm going to show you what we're after. Now, like the, I'm in Hebrews 8, 9. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Now watch this. Here's a phrase that's important. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, saith the Lord. Are you with me? Now, notice on your, on your sheet of paper, that's, that comes from Jeremiah 31, 32. In the Hebrew Bible... In the Hebrew text, here's the Hebrew text of the same portion of that verse. Are you with me? My covenant, which they broke. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Let me grab Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah. I, I just go into my Jeremiah 31. 32, 31, 32, 31, 32. 
out of the New American Standard. The New American Standard is going to quote it and in, in, listen to me. Now, it's important. My, if you've got a King James Bible, the way it is said in, 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 uh, in Hebrews 8, 9 is the way they're going to say it over here. If it's in my in New, New American so my New American Standard, as far as the Hebrew, f from the Hebrew Bible, in, in your King James Bible, from the Hebrew Bible to the King James Bible or from the Hebrew Bible to the New American Standard Bible, it's going to say the same thing. All right. And here's what, here's what it says. And, this, and, I, and what I quoted was from the original text. But here's what it says, and I'm going just down to that one section. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband of them, declares the Lord. <clears throat> Do you see that? Now, the, the Hebrew Bible, that's exactly, the NAS was right on the money. All right? Right on the money with, it, with, with what the Hebrew Bible said. And you see what it says? They broke covenant. I, and I was a father to them. I was a husband, not a father. I was a husband. Why? Because this is a covenant. It's a covenant just like in marriage, and he used it as a covenant. Isn't it terrible that we don't believe? Even the church of Jesus Christ doesn't believe that marriage is a covenant. I mean, how, what are you going to do with the passages like this? In a covenant passage, he says, uh, your marriage is a covenant. And uh, you're my bride, and I'm your husband. I, you're my wife and I'm your husband, right? This is that. Now, when you, when you come to the Hebrew passage, I'm still in my NAS Bible. When they translate that here, now they translate it, my, my Bible translated correct from the Hebrew, agreed, in Jeremiah. Notice how they translated it here. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, saith the Lord. That's not the same, is it? Would you agree with that? And you're going to find the same thing in your King James Bible. From the Hebrew to Jeremiah, it's going to say one thing. And then it's whether or not it says it again in the, the Koine text. Are you with me? Okay. Is that, I'm not getting too confusing, am I? All right. I don't want to because I don't, I don't want to get this too technical. Now, along comes the Septuagint. All right? Along comes the Septuagint. The Septuagint text of the same text, now we've translated to the Greek. Now pay attention to me, this is important. For they abode, now watch, same little passage. For they abode not in my covenant, and I disregarded them, saith the Lord. That's the Septuagint. Now, if you don't have a Septuagint, you can go buy one. I mean, you can buy a Septuagint, right? It's a Greek translation of the Old Testament. So there's that one. They say, now, see, they've changed that, haven't it? That's been a, that's been a change in there, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the Koine, where Hebrews comes from, is Koine Greek. That's the, the Koine Greek text. And I, I told you how, what they read. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care, care for them, saith the Lord. Right? Now, let me show you. Now, here's what's important. Look Go back and look at the Septuagint. Look at the Septuagint check, text. Do you see it? Are you looking at it? The abode not? Yeah. See, the word ook is not. But see, E-M-M-E-N-O? Yeah. Okay? That's the tr that is a, a, a translation of, of breaking covenant. That's the idea. Okay? In the Greek. That shows you the difficulty in translating. I, and when it says, and, and I dis not regard, look at that. Now, let's stay with abode. E-M-M-E-N-O. In the Koine Greek, look at there. Look what the word is in the Koine Greek. In the Greek New Testament, see the word? Do you see it? L look at the way it's identified in the Greek language. Aorist active indicative. A A I. Look down there. Look down in the in the Koine Greek translation. Same thing, isn't it? Now let's look at the second word. Disregard. You see that a m e l e o, aorist active indicative. That should be an indicative. Look down below. It's the same word. Agreed. It's the same word. A identical. So where is the Koine? What are they translating off from? 
sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes they're translating straight out of the Septuagint, and that's a good case. They're translating it directly off from it. And the words that they're using, the words that they're using are, are telling us basically the same thing in a different, in a different mode. Tell the same thing. They're telling us that they broke covenant. They broke covenant. And, and, and when they did, boom. They, now let me show you another thing. Let me show you another thing. Up there in the Hebrew text, go, go, go back up to the Hebrew text where it says they broke. See, this, the, the Greek is saying, well, that, this is breaking covenant, is discontinuing, it's walking away from the deal. It's a walking away. All right. I mean, that's, that's the Greek idea of it. Okay? Now, but go back to the Hebrew idea of breaking covenant. That word that for breaking covenant there, show you how strong God feels about breaking covenant is found in Leviticus, the 26th chapter. In Leviticus, the 26th chapter, verses 15 through 18, we're dealing with the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Israel, which Jeremiah and his people are going through when he wrote this book. Broke covenant, breaking covenant for Jeremiah was an enormously big deal, bigger than it was when they, when, when they put out the Septuagint and when they wrote the Koine, even though it's going to become a big deal because they're about to go under it. But the word break covenant is used there. And listen, you know, there are five cycles. In the first cycle, when you are studying Leviticus 26, 15 through 18, you're in the first cycle of five disciplines. And he sets the stage. First of all, he tells you, you're going to go under five cycles of discipline Number one, if you break covenant and you've broke covenant, and here's the first cycle. Here's what he says. He says, Pat, come, back to, come back to the covenant. And if you don't, listen to me, if you don't, when the second one comes, it's going to be seven times worse. If you go to the second cycle, it will be, and listen, I'm going to discipline you for breaking covenant. Come, come back. Come back to the covenant. And if you break the second one, I'm going to rev it up seven times more. And if you break the third, I'm going to rev it up seven times more. And if you break the fourth, I'm going to rev it up seven times more. And when the fifth comes, it will take your breath away and you wish you'd never been born. And the word is to break covenant. When you get to the New Testament, when the New Testament comes along, they realize God broke the covenant. God, God fulfilled that covenant and has now established a new one. And so that's not, when we come to Hebrews 8 chapter, bre breaking the covenant is not as big an issue as, listen, as Christ coming into the world. I tell you, I think as, the, as, as Christian people, we don't realize what a big deal in the plan of God it was for Jesus to come into the world and die on a cross. When he did, he fulfilled the old covenant and established the new one. We're new covenant people. It's, it's just, you go like, well, why would they change why would they change this language, especially from the coin? Why would they change that? Because they realized that the Messiah had come. The book of Hebrews is all about Jesus Christ. In fact, the whole new covenant is all about the first four gospels. It's all about Jesus has come into the world. And the rest of the book is, and why? To die on a cross, to be buried, to be raised from the dead, to bring you into the kingdom. By grace, through faith, and not of yourself as a gift. It's just, and listen, if you really wanted to get into a real interesting study of some, he, of some history, you ought to go back and study the time of, uh, the period of when the Septuagint 
came in to its full-blown ministry. So that by the time Christ leaves the earth, the Septuagint is an established book of the Bible, kind of like the King James Bible was. Or the New American Standard is. I mean, it was their book. It was their Bible. You know how that, and the history behind it is just phenomenal. The history behind it. That'd be a good study for Kniep, wouldn't it? I mean, just that period alone is just, I mean, if you see what God did by moving uh, uh, powerful leaders like, uh, like uh, Al um, Alexander the Great, right? Alexander the Great. I mean, <laughs> he put that Bible in everybody's hand because the, the Greek language was the language that you had to know to, to do business, to get along, to do everything, just like English. I mean, and listen, what a short life he had and what an enormous impact. I mean, how's that happen? God's in control of all this stuff. That's just interesting, I, I know. And what happens when, you, when they, they break covenant? What happens when they break covenant? Like when you look at the discipline that Israel went under in 586 B.C., 722 B.C., and then in 70 A.D.? Hmm. I mean, you would not want anybody to go through that. You would not want anybody to go through that. But you know what happens when that happens? What he, what he tells us in, 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 in um, Leviticus 26? He says that when God does that, when he puts you under severe discipline, where you're moving towards the sin and to death, he, he removes his divine protective hedge from you. Do you know how bad that is when he does that? You get into divine discipline, bow your back, and will not come back to God, he will put you into some serious place. Will you lose your salvation? Absolutely not. That's been secured by somebody other than you. Mm -mm. But boy, will he tear up your life. You know, as one guy told me one day, he made a believer out of me. He was already a believer. I knew what he meant when he said he made a believer out of me. But listen, in Job, remember Job, the first chapter, verse 10, the, de the devil and, and, and God and Job in that, that deal. He said, well, I'd, I'd like to, but I can't because you've got to what? You've got to hedge around him. And you know, that's interesting because in the chapter 29, which we studied many years ago, chapter 29, the first six verses, is really interesting about that. You ought to, you ought to hear his discussion on that, uh, where he got kind of personal about it. Well, anyhow, uh, the third thing is sometimes a change of translation is because of a change of covenants. For example, from the old covenant to the new covenant, what you're seeing when when, when you don't see a great change from the Hebrew to the, the Septuagint other than the language and culture. But when you come to the Koine Greek, you've got a change of, you've got a change of covenants. And with a change of covenant comes a change of theology. And so when, you, when you're talking about, when you're talking like the writer of Hebrews showing the old covenants out and the new covenants in, he's in this transitional period. This is what he's dealing with. He's dealing with getting people to understand there's a different theology. A different theology, man. <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough to get people to adjust their theology sometimes, let alone, th I mean, holy mackerel. I mean, when I, when I laid all that out and I said, you need to pay attention to the transitional period, and I went and I showed you all the changes that had to occur from the old covenant to new covenant, I, I, I don't know, about eight or so, ten on that list. They're giants. And listen, if you would have been living in that period, it would have shook up your world. 
and you would have had to really go into study and paid attention to what the Word of God was teaching. Those guys out there on the front line were, were giants. They were giants uh, as communicators. You talk about a tough road. Oh, man. Let me give you another example. In Romans 8.8, 8, in Romans 8.8, 8, I want to show you another thing. The Hebrew of Jeremiah 31.31. 31. In Jeremiah 31.31, 31, or in our text, Hebrews 8.8, 8, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord. Watch. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, right? This word in the Hebrew is an idea. Uh, it's a covenant word. In, in English, in America today, we would, we would probably say cutting a deal. To enter a covenant with somebody, you had to cut a deal to enter a covenant. And it was, so it's kind of terms we would use. Well, in the Old Testament, when they cut a deal, they actually cut, they, they actually cut an animal, divided up. You know, remember the story of Abraham when they did that. But that was, there's a cutting a deal. And that's where that whole idea came from. And so when he says, when I make a, a, when I will make covenant, I will make a covenant, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the Judah. That's a prophetic word, isn't it? Because they were already under one and said, listen, I'm going to put a new one. You're going to go under a new one. Uh, but I will make. Now in the Septuagint, that's it. Uh, now I'm abbreviating L LXX because 72 people were part of translating it. The Septuagint of Jeremiah 31, 30 says, when I will make, notice the Greek word, say, same in the English, but the, notice the Greek word, and, and that Greek word, uh, D-I-A-T-I-T-H-E-M-I, -E means to make covenant. In other words, it's the equivalent, again, it's the equivalent of um, making a deal, a covenant deal, making a, a, entering a covenant, make a, make a covenant. In the Koine, now watch this. In the Koine of, of Hebrews 8.8, 8, let's go, just put your eyes on Hebrews 8.8. 8. When, when the Koine Greek says, when I will effect, or what does yours say? Effect a new covenant? What, what's the word before new covenant? NIV, yeah. Okay. So notice it's a different word. Look at the Greek word. Look at the Septuagint. D-I-A. See, we saw it a moment ago. It was exact, wasn't it? Now pay attention to me. Remember when we looked at verse 32? Remember when the Greek, when the Septuagint laid it out in the Greek? They came right up behind in the Koine and laid out the same words, didn't they? The same Greek words and the same structure, right? Didn't this time. They did not this time. Notice in the Septuagint, we have the word D-I-A-T-I-T-H-E-M-I. -I -I? But notice when it comes out of the Koine text, it's S-U-N-T-E-L-E-O. Right? Right? Now, the last time, they didn't change it, did they? Right? Because... It wasn't important theologically to change it. Because we're talking about, we got this covenant, we're going to bring in a new covenant. It wasn't important to change it. But it's important to change it this time because the writer is telling you theologically, the old covenant is obsolete. He's going to say that in verse 13. In verse 13 of our passage, Hebrews 8, he's going to say the old covenant is obsolete. It's uh, growing old and it's going to disappear. All right. So he uses, he changes the, this word theologically. It's theologically. Uh, I don't know any other way to tell you. And listen to this word. The word that was handpicked to put it. Now listen, who do you believe did that? According to our beginning, who, who is all scripture inspired of God? See, don't, don't you question it now. And is, is, is no prophecy of the will of man? Don't question it now. 
Because if it is, if it is, God will point it out and note it so that you know there are false teachers. He will show you. All right? It's important. Don't get, don't get all the side, weaken your faith. Because this is theological. As a result of the first advent, here's the theology. As, the first, as a result of the first advent of Jesus Christ, the theology of the new covenant changed the meaning of the word make in the Hebrew and from the Greek into soon teleo. Soon teleo means, to, it's a compound word, soon on the front of that word means together, and teleo means to complete, like teleos. This is a verbal form. This teleos. It means to, now this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you why he did this is theologically. It means, means to make complete by bringing together. This is exactly what Paul taught in Ephesians 2, 11 through 20, 22. Is exactly what he taught. Okay? I'm telling you, now I want to go to point five before I, uh, point four before I get out of here because I want to deal with the theology. I'll be to that passage in a moment. The new covenant theology is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If he doesn't come into the world, the days are coming when Christ would come into the world, die on a cross, be back. Listen, without the, cruci without the death, burial, and resurrection, there is no new covenant. Everything, everything is based on his coming and completing the mission God sent him to do. The new, new, the new covenant theology is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice that little cross and symbol says he dies on a cross, he's buried, he's raised from the dead. Now listen to it. Here's Hebrews, the ninth chapter, where we're headed uh, uh, days from now. Okay? Yeah, I know. Listen to this. How much more with the blood of Christ, that's the whole crucifixion theology, the blood of Christ. How much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, that's voluntary, that's John 10, 18, without blemish, that's 1 Peter 1, 19, without blemish, no birth defects, no growth defects, without blemish and spot, without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's a question. Notice that's a question. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death, crucifixion, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, Adam. See, who is the, who, who, who is the, who is the father of the first covenant? Adam. Who is the father of the second covenant? Christ. In that first Adam, last Adam, right? First Adam, last Adam. Uh, let's see. Let me get back. He's a meter of new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those, th those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now watch this. Now I'm in second, I'm in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. Watch this now. This is where there's all, this, this is the theology behind this word, soon teleo. Here it is. For he himself... That, that, listen, you know what that is in theology? Grace. When it says he himself, I mean me and nobody else. Not you, not, not the horsemen that come to get Humpty Dumpty fixed. None of you. For he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, for he himself, the one who went to the cross, bore our sins, buried and raised from the dead, for he himself was our peace. Watch this now. Who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by establishing his flesh, the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, that's positional peace, and might reconcile them both in one body, that is the church in Christ, to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. You understand that? Listen to me now. What did the word soon to teleo mean? It means, means to complete by bringing two things together. 
that is the Jew and the Gentile. Because that's the only way they were divided up. We call it unbeliever and believer today. Under the new covenant, that's the way we think. You're either a believer or not believer. So, I tell you, let, let me close with this. Let me give you, a, write this on your piece of paper if you're interested. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I would tell you something interesting to look at. Look at how you go to the book of Malachi. It's the last book of the old covenant. And look how he closed the book. Just read, just, not now, when you go home. <laughs> Sometime, look how he closed, look at the, at the very end, about four or five verses of how the writer closes the book. And then go to the book of Revelation and look how the writer closed his book. And the story in between those two closings of those two great books is where we live and have our being. We live in one of the most phenomenal periods of biblical history you could have ever chose to live and in the right nation. We may have a lot of faults, but let me tell you, this is one great nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. I mean, we are one great nation. In the midst of all of our faults, put us up against any of the others, we're lights out. We're the most generous people, and that's because the church is still well. Well, anyhow. All right, that'll give you something to sleep on. All scriptures inspired of God. Never forget that. And if it doesn't look like it makes sense, just study a little more and the Holy Spirit will show you it does make sense. It does make sense. Scripture built upon Scripture. Okay, let me close in prayer and we'll let them off and then we'll have our time of prayer. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these have come our way to study with us. Old covenant fulfilled, new covenant brought into being. We'll, the new covenant is both the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. We live in the power of the first coming, the dynamics of it in our life. We are so blessed. I pray, Father, we become students of the Bible because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We are to live by faith and not by sight. Therefore, all of this fits together in a nice package in our life as we walk this out in our life for Jesus Christ. I pray that he would be our light to guide our path and that we would be able to take a lot of people down that path with us because of the light we have in him. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.